All right, let's get started. Hello, this is Ray Sammy from Jennifer Shouse Associates. Welcome to the 2018 edition of Webinar Wednesdays, brought to you live from Washington, D.C., and hosted by Jennifer Shouse and Associates. Our topics cover all things related to U.S. federal government contracts. Thank you for joining us today. Our panelists are industry experts and include consultants, attorneys, accountants, and other professionals who work in the federal contracting sector. Our webinars are complimentary and are held every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. They, are all, they can all be viewed on our YouTube channel or directly under our website under the webinars tab. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so please send your questions directly to the speaker. His information is available on the last slide. All right, a little bit about us. We are a Washington, D.C.-based consulting firm serving both product and service companies worldwide. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and contract administration. We can help you with the GSA schedule, proposal writings, 8A certification, and more. We host events throughout the year, including training classes, so please visit our website or sign up for a complimentary newsletter to stay current. Today, we are fortunate enough to be joined by David Dempsey of Dempsey Fontana Law. David will be discussing bid protest, what's new, what's old, and why do we care? You can see some of David's background on this page. You can also see some information on Dempsey Fontana Law on this page. So thanks for joining us, David. Let's dig into bid protests. What's new, what's old, and why do we care? Okay, then if we um, go to the next slide here, I'll start with what's new. And uh, in terms of the filing process associated with a bid protest, that should change uh, somewhat dramatically midway through the year. The GAO has instituted an, an electronic protest and docketing system, or, or EDPS as they refer to it, and that will uh, <clears throat> provide you uh, with an electronic, with the only way to uh, file a protest. Uh, the reason I have the GAO webpage up there on legal is because that will give everybody a description of the process, particularly timeliness requirements, particularly protective orders, which I'll be referring to later under the RAND study. And then you can uh, do a word search uh, for decisions that GAO has issued, and you can check out uh, Right now, you could check out your own protest if you have one to see how that's coming along or at least filed and uh, the schedule for it. Uh, do that by the B number or the protester and you can sort out. And then you can also um, learn learn quite a bit about about you know the counsel you've got doing the protest if you if you're not if you're not doing it yourself. And I'll be getting into this um, website a little bit like on the close to the last side. So on the next slide, we indicate that the uh, there are some details associated with EB, EPDS. It's a fully developed system. It's going to be some prototype testing. There'll be a Federal Register announcement soon enough. And there's going to be a filing fee now for protests. And this filing fee, according to GAO, is to maintain the the cost of EPDF. Uh, you note there under filing fee bullet that the payment must be processed in order to initiate a uh, completed bid protest filing, and that's going to make a difference with respect to the timeliness of a protest. Now, in return for that, you get the receipt of payment. That's one thing, but the the thing that is most new is agency notification. As many of you know, the, the way to stop contract performance through a protest is to file within a certain period of time, which is you know the, the 10 days before after award or five days, currently five days under the um, after debriefing. That's the two basic ways, but. The protest itself is not going to stop anything unless the agency is notified within that time period. So the distinction, of course, is that filing something at GAO does not stop the award, 
the performance of the, of the awarded contract, but the agency notification. So for the first time, GAO is providing that electronically. And then GAO has been uh, <clears throat> uh, quite explicit about the fact that you don't get a refund. So if you were to file a protest and withdraw it, uh, that's still going to be $350 that uh, has to be paid out. Now, on the next slide, we bring up the uh, statutory changes in the 2018 uh, National Defense Authorization Act. You have the site there. There's two particular things associated with debriefing, excuse me, with protest. First is the enhanced debriefing. Uh, first of all, it's Defense Department only. And then you can see some of the parameters here associated with the what Congress considered to be a, an improvement of sorts, which is uh, first it has to be over $100 million. And if, if the contract exceeds $100 million and it's protested, then the protester will receive the source selection award determination. My parenthetical there is to explain that the procedures that the source selection determination is, is disclosed uh, will be, uh, uh, could be a very heavily redacted uh, document. I don't know. One of the, uh, one of the features of the, uh, of the protest is whether or not it'd be under a protest, whether it'd be in a protected order. And then with respect to the awards that exceed 10 million but are less than 100 million, and it's a small business, then according to the statutory language, the small business protester has an option to request disclosure. Uh, it's not clear if that's going to be translated into the uh, forthcoming regulations to be a, to be a right uh, to have that source selection uh, information. Uh, but it'll be heavily redacted if it's going to uh, to the protester themselves. And you can see this, apply, this applies to all defense contracts, including task order awards in excess to 10 million. And that 10 million, as many of you know, is the GAO jurisdictional amount. And then the successful offeror is also entitled to a source selection award determination. Um, that's that's nice. Uh, whether they're going to get more from that document or from the uh, first uh, meeting, uh, post award meeting, is difficult to say. Now the next thing regarding the uh, debriefing is uh, on the next page where we have something that is new, and that is a debriefing can be followed up with questions, and the protester after its initial debrief has two days to submit questions. The defense agency then has five days to respond, five days from the receipt of the response of the, of the, of the questions. So instead of the five days that used to be <clears throat> the norm for after the first debrief, uh, it's now gonna be five days after the Defense Department agency has uh, responded with the follow-up question. So it's a follow-up time frame that starts the the uh, clock ticking for purposes of whether or not you can stop a ward by virtue of the uh, um, stay provisions. Now, one of the uh, questions, since this statute is uh, fairly, this section 818 is, is, is not nearly as clear as uh, I would like it to be, nor is the legislative history to it particularly useful. Uh, right now, if the debriefing is required, it's only required when the, the protester seeks the uh, debriefing within three days and, and written, you know, the email says we want the written request and that's what 15, FAR 15.506 says. Uh, but there's also going to be uh, changes in the regulations that will be relevant to the follow-up response. Uh, there may be changes, well, there have to be changes in the FAR, but, but they'll initially start out in the DFAR with respect to what 
information should be provided at protester upon the uh, filing of a protest. Uh, right now, what uh, a protester will get, according to the FAR, this is in Part 33, um, they'll get a copy of the solicitation and and uh, and then whatever is relevant, whatever the agency considers relevant. So, it's a practical matter. Um, what a protester gets is documents it already has, uh, plus whatever is considered relevant, plus the agency report and the uh, and the agency's uh, defense of the protest if they are going to do one. Uh, so those changes will be coming out, and I would advise you all to uh, take a look at these changes because DoD has a knack for for going a little further or doing a little less than Congress indicates when it comes to some of these procurement uh, changes that that uh, Congress makes. Now the other element on the next slide related to the uh, NDAA is Section 827. And that, as you can see in a small bullet there, is uh, kind of a yawner of a statute. Uh, because I'm so diplomatic, I put yawner instead of stupid. And the reason I don't think it makes any sense is a couple things. First, it's a it's a pilot program that starts in two years, and then it ends in uh, five years, and you get information that we pretty much already get from the GAO. Um, but we have these, you know, the protest has to be denied. The protester has to be a company large enough, uh, you know, 250 million a year, and it's got this time frames for it to come under this 827 pilot program. Now, I've pointed out over the years when I've been an intervener, uh, and I think the protester has been uh, less than forthcoming, shall we say, in their in their protests. I point out to them, FAR 33.104 um, DH8, which is a inability of the government if the protest has been sustained because the awardee was lying to the government, then the government can get that money money back if they wish. But that, to me, is a is a pretty useful sanction. Unfortunately, I don't know of any instance where it's ever been uh, been applied, but it could have been. Now, what's also news explained in the RAND report, which is on the next slide. And the RAND report, I have the the. Uh, a web link to it underneath. This is a fairly lengthy report, and it's actually uh, fairly informative, and, and it's sufficiently informative that's worth worth going through and bringing to your attention. Uh, it focuses on GAO protests and the uh, Court of Federal Claims protests. Uh, with respect to GAO pro protests, they've indicated a relative increase. But they've also noted that it's 0.3% uh, of all the contract actions, and this is only for the Defense Department. So although protests go up and seem to impact quite a bit of us during the course of a year, it's a very small amount of actual contract actions. And then the uh, there's two conclusions there that I think are worth pointing out because they don't seem to be the prevalent thought. The first one is that protests are uh, generally have some merit to it. And whether or not the awardee thinks so, the grand study indicates. And then in terms of being a uh, effective protest or a sustained protest, they say when you when you hire a lawyer, you have a better chance of getting some kind of remedial action. And that's, uh, I think that's principally due to the protective order so more information will go to the lawyers uh, than to the protester and if they can work with it correctly then then uh, you'll have a better chance. RAN report also has some I got some dots here on things that some of you already know. End of the fiscal year is when they go up. Task order solicitations have a higher slightly higher effectiveness rate and with respect to uh, uh, defense agencies, there seem to be measurable differences on the overall effectiveness than a non-DOD agency, which means the uh, DOD is uh, uh, 
not doing too well vis-a-vis -vis the protests. Uh, and then the last thing is, see the other two dots, the third bullet, uh, the last bullet is the protesters and protest actions go up with contracts value. And I think we all know that. And finally, when we get to the RAND report on the next page, and this is the Federal Court of Claims, or the Court of Federal Claims, sustained rate, the sustained rate is declining, but the number of cases is increasing. And according to RAND, the increasing trend uh, suggests that companies are more willing to protest at the Court of Federal Claims. Now, the basic reason for that, I think, would be the amount of documentation that occurs or that's required to be provided at the Court of Federal Claims. There's Appendix C to the COFC rules lays out what uh, must be provided to the protester in the administrative uh, record, and that's quite extensive. Uh, it's uh, immeasurably more information than you would get from a GAO protest uh, normally. And then the fact that the number of COFC cases uh, seems to be increasing, they're not quite sure about that. So some of that data is, is there to allow that statement. And then they have some anecdotal uh, evidence vis-a-vis uh, -vis some discussions that they've had with GAO personnel, that sort of thing. So the RAND report is probably worth uh, looking at. And if not, at least, uh, at least the one and a half page summary of it, which you have the link for, uh, so you can take a look. Now, I've, I've got this uh, presentation talking about the, the old, the new, and why do we care? And with that in mind, I have to admit that this uh, last, uh, this next slide on bid protest, why do we care, is another, another slide up, it'll be uh, number 16. And that should probably say old news and why do we care? And the old news is the GAO report to Congress, which is issued every year. And there you have the link to it so you can take a look. Uh, but there's some, there's some useful information there when you're thinking about whether to protest or not. First, in the third, in the third bullet there, you've got the reason that protests are sustained. Now that's five basic reasons, uh, not all uh, not all the same one, but there's no breakdown on exactly what that is. And keep in mind that the uh, the sustain the the sustain rate of 17% is obviously significantly lower than it was in 2016, but in 2015 and 14 and such and 13 it was about the same and a little a little higher so 17 is a, is, is a pretty good number i think for purposes of figuring out whether you're going to get a sustained or a, your protest would be upheld and now the gao is taking uh is, is making a i think a fair analysis of what the effectiveness rate is in 2017 it was 47 percent one percent higher and that comes as a combination of the agency corrective actions and uh, sustains. And I calculated, they give a GAO explained that there were 99 sustains. So I figured out, <coughs> excuse me, that there would have been 28 corrective actions and that's how they get the 47%. Oh, that's fine. I'm, tend to think that corrective action is a little low because I know our firm here had uh, five or six or maybe seven over the last uh, 18, 20 months. Uh, but anyway, we're only going by the data uh, that's provided at that web link. So now we get to why do we care? And we care about protests because we uh, you might win one. So these decisions that I've laid out here are kind of a combination of uh, uh, value on how you can win a protest. They're examples of uh, the elements, excuse me, the, the, the 
bases that you might want to protest are set forth on the previous slide. But the uh, <clears throat> I think the most interesting one would be the Latvian connection reconsideration case because that company was actually suspended from protesting uh, for two years. And that's a rather unusual uh, sanction. They were suspended for one year and then they asked GAO to reconsider that and then they got suspended for two years. With respect to Walker development and um, protection strategies, we got to sustain where there was a problem with adequate documentation. And that is, I think, the most likely way you would win a protest. In other words, the agency cannot explain why they came to the decision that they did that's on the record somewhere. Therefore, it seems arbitrary, et cetera. And then with uh, McCann, we have a, another cocktail conversation kind of protest where the Army insisted that the offeror submit prices in Excel. The protester did it in PDF and uh, protested. And of course, uh, well, in this case, uh, they the protester won. This is a bit unusual because it's normal for a uh, um, GAO to say when you have to, when a war is going to be based on conforming to the solicitation requirements, you didn't do it, then they will uphold the or, or not uphold the protest, uphold the agency's opinion. Now, with respect to uh, future protests, the only area that I can think of that would be different would be in the cybersecurity areas. Uh, the DOD, anyway, has made it clear that cybersecurity is going to be a function of the evaluation. And uh, as a practical matter, that means the evaluation, excuse me, the cybersecurity plans are, are going to be enforced by the, by the agency's language in the solicitation. And if your, your cyber plan says X and someone says X plus, then there'll be a basis uh, to award to, the, to your competitor. On the last uh, slide, I've, I've given us uh, the link to WIFCON.com. This is a website that I look at every day. And on this particular link here where it says slash protest, they identify where in the FAR for protest purposes that most of the research has been done. And you can see what those uh, <clears throat> um, items or those issues are identified. Now, uh, most lawyers know this, but if you go to WIFCOM, you can WIFCON, you can also go to this this link, and you can select a FAR provision, like it says here on the left, and there they will provide virtually all the cases that WIFCON thinks is relevant, uh, all the protest decisions, GAO and Court of Federal Claims, so you can analyze whether or not you're going to have much chance of uh, succeeding on a on a protest and at least for the reported decisions that WIFCON concentrates on um, your ability to win or likelihood of winning is is going to be low it's going to be much much uh, higher much less than 17 percent anyway I'm uh, complete I'm finished up now and if anyone has any questions just uh, uh, send me an email on it and I'll uh, get back to you with the answer. Thank you very much. Great. And, uh, thank you for listening today. Great. Thank you so much, David. Great presentation information. And thanks again for sharing your time and knowledge on this topic. And thanks especially to our attendees. If you have any questions, please contact David directly with the, in, with the information that you see upon your screen now. Next week, we are covering all small mentor protege. The full schedule of webinars can be found on our website under webinars. Today's recording will also be on our website later this week. Thanks again, and this concludes our webinar.